Where were you guys? We were Stop. waiting to be called I was called looking on. all over for you guys. Where's the mic? Who's this chick on the end? Who are you? Oi, who are you? Hi, I'm Kristen. I'm moderating. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Well, although... Hello. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Tony. Kristen, how are you? There? I'm well. I'm, well. I'm usually here. You're there. All right. Kristen, uh, let me just say one thing. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, I am not asking a single question because it's going to you guys. We're going to hop from side to side until I inevitably forget which side I was last on, in which case I will need your help. But let's start over here, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you all for doing this. Um, wanted to ask you how you felt the show changed over the years and your character specifically and what kind of impact direction you as actors were able to give to maybe make the changes that you wanted over the course of the show's run. You that might be the most serious process question I've ever been asked at a convention. Thank you. Well, then you answer it, Will. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that it is safe to say that we all grew into our roles over the course of the first two seasons as the writers figured out exactly who our characters were and began to take advantage of pieces of our individual personalities that they didn't have access to when they were writing the first season before we were cast. And I think it becomes very clear around season two when... when, when it when, definitely did. When, it definitely and so did. succinct and so accurate. Yes. When, when Frakes grows the beard, the show grows the beard. <laughs> And, and it is, and it is around and that Diana time. And Diana Muldar was the doctor. My character, it was like I went to a little, you know, it was a swerve. It was definitely a character swerve. It was swerve. a change for you. It was a change for me, and I embraced it. In the second year, <laughs> Gates looked very different. They made a lot of changes with her character. And then from the third season on, I think we, we all back. knew kind of what we were doing. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you from my point of view as a child on the show, the writing and producers, they never listened to any of my ideas, which was probably good. And, and as a woman, they didn't listen to me either. And, and as, as a woman, that's why I wasn't there the second season, because they, they didn't like what I was suggesting. And so, you know, they went their own way. But over the years, the thing that I think came through that's really, that, that made, makes Next Generation so memorable and makes us endure so long is that our love for each other and the bond that we shared as actors translated into the bonds that our characters uh, should also naturally have had. How did I do? Yeah, yeah that was good. Right. Beautiful. Good. Thank you. And yes, over here, please. please. Uh, settle a little bit. Uh, the year is 1985. I'm nope, you lose. It's 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 10 years old. Our school has our first field trip to a Broadway play called Big River. <gasps> Two years later, I see this actor. I swear I see him. Was that you, Mr. Brent Spiner? As a woman. <laughs> Yeah, that was me. But do you know what? I mean, even more interesting, who did you replace? Rene Aubergenois. Odo. He created the part. I came in behind him and uh, took over and, when he left. And I was living with the producer of it. That's right. <laughs> she was. TMI, TMI. <laughs> thank, thank you. Wasn't John Goodman also in that play? John Goodman was in it. But did you see me in it? I saw you in it. How was he? Amazing. I thank you for saying that. I read your lips. Amazing. <laughs> you got two thumbs up. That, that's yeah. unambiguous two thumbs up. No, totally. I, your talent is undeniable. Well. Yeah, seconded. I, 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 right? I don't know if I, 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 Data is my favorite. Data is everybody's favorite. Data is everybody's favorite. But Data is truly my favorite character. No? And if it hadn't been for you, Brent, yeah. I wouldn't have loved Data so much. Well, and you know what I like to say about your work? What? You were given the most limited canvas on which to paint. Yes. And yet you did the most elegant and fulfilling painting of any of the actors in the company. You know, I got to say, thank you. I, you're welcome. I, uh, I never tire of hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over here, please. Yeah, so uh, you may not be able to answer this, but since cons are sometimes known for reveals, do any of you have any plans to be on the new Picard show? And specifically for Gates, would you be open to or have any knowledge to um, exploring the, your relationship with Patrick Stewart in that show? 
I, I would love to. Uh, I have not been approached, and uh, I, but I would, I would be very interested. Yes, They're I would be very interested. They're guarding that in show like the nuclear codes. I'd well, say they're a little bit more responsible with that show than we are with Nuclear <laughs> Codes right now. Yeah, Matter good point, good point, yeah. Well, the CIA is sponsoring this, so you're, you're welcome to tell us. Yeah, well, we don't know. We don't know. We know nothing. Literally, you probably guys looking on the internet. I'll let you know. I'm going to start on that show on Monday. I'll yeah. fill you guys in next time I see you. Thank you. So glad you said Over here, that. hi. Hi. Uh, so, I know that this may... Uh, not please everybody in the audience because of the command line, but growing up with Will Wheaton as being someone that I could directly relate to as a kid yes. was awesome. And I've always wanted to see him go farther. Um, so have you guys ever considered doing a spinoff where they go on a type of engineering mission with Will Wheaton as the captain? Uh, <laughs> and would you guys come in? <laughs> I think looking at you, when they reboot the show, I would cast you as Riker. I can do the sit and I can do the lean. How's your British accent? Mm, not very good. Yeah, Riker, I say. Yeah, great. Um, so, I, Is he talking I, about Will Wheaton or Wesley Crusher? I feel like he's... Wesley I Crusher. mean, I think he's talking about Wesley Crusher, but I like to hear my name. I knew you did. I knew you it feels, did. It feels good. Let me have this. He said, have we ever... The, the, pre it? the premise of your question is so kind, and, and, and I love it. The reality is um, I'm going to be 47 years old this year. And, my and, boy. And, my I know, boy. I know. And I think they've told Wesley. I'm 47. Story. How's that possible? I'm I finally caught you. I'm 47. Wait a second. I finally seven. caught up. That's what happened. That's so weird. So, you were so much younger. I know, but I caught up. That's what happens. Wow. It's, there's a museum here that's all about time. You should go. It's amazing. Um, I appreciate the premise of your question so very much. The reality is I don't think that will ever happen. I think that the time to explore that character has come and gone. And there are so many wonderful new Star Trek stories to tell with Discovery and with this upcoming Picard series that... It's not our time anymore, and that's fine. That's totally fine, that's great. Um, all of that said, if anyone asked me to be involved in Star Trek, I love it so much that I would do everything I can to say yes. I wouldn't do it just to do it. I would do it if the, right, if the role was right and I was gonna get to work with people I love. Awesome, thank you. Hi, yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, guys. Hey, friends. <laughs> so, I work for the public library, so I always like to ask, uh, what is one book you think everyone should read? Ooh. Morgan, you come up with the best <laughs> questions, honestly, and the hardest. How about Howard Zinn's, his alternative history of the United States? That, that would be a good place to start. You know, you, we get the one textbook at school, why not get the other? Or I would say any book about the Constitution that also makes you read the first, you know, go to the first source, read the Constitution. It's a great thing to read. Well, How about Malcolm Gladwell's understand. Outliers? Okay. What did he say? Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Outliers. Outliers. Yeah. 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 I'm going to cheat and pick two because that's the way that I roll. Uh, the Autobiography of Malcolm X and, uh, and uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle. Oh, excellent. That's cradle, yeah. Well, I and by the way, the reason I am a writer is because a librarian took an interest in me when I was a little boy and nobody was interested in the stuff that I cared about. So thank you for working with the public library and for making a difference in people's lives. The reason How about Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man? Yeah. It's a heavy lift, but it's worth reading. But it's no Ulysses. What That's is? true. About the Odyssey or, or you know, uh, the Iliad. I love the Iliad, I gotta say. <laughs> I read it in Greek. Um... <laughs> she read it in Greek? She read it in Greek. Bam, mic drop. Wow. <laughs> I did. I did ancient Greek as an O-level. I did. Um, I, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be more um, literature than them because be I don't Suzanne. read a lot of modern books. <laughs> I don't, actually. Um, oh, no, wait a second. I lie. I lie. <laughs> I absolutely 
loved all the Dragon Tattoo, the Dragon Tattoo trilogy. I know it's fluff and it's not, you know, heavy duty literature, but I was literally desolate when I closed the book on the last page. Um, the other book that I think everyone should read and all the boys are gonna groan is Pride and Prejudice. Thank you. Thank you. And over here. Uh, it's... Shoot, did I skip something? You're good, you're good. Okay, okay, I'm good. Okay, I just... All right, okay, I just completely just wanted to say freaked out. One last thing, the reason I'm not a writer today is I was once beaten by a librarian. <laughs> They're very tough. Matter of fact, it was you, wasn't it? It's usually what we do. Yeah. Over Thank here, you. please. Thanks, Hi. Josh, thanks, Morgan. Okay, uh, it's convenient that the three men are on one side of the panel because this is more for you guys. Uh, part of your- Oh, thank God, someone will finally get to hear men speak. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because we haven't heard men talk enough in history, right? I think so, you'll like this, though. All right. Part of the story arc of your characters is that they are all in some way growing up, learning to be an adult, learning to be in a relationship, learning to be human. Was there something that they had written for your character or a line or a scene that you just went, that is way too ABC after school special, and then when you actually saw it, it in final form you went, oh, that actually really worked really well to show this character growing up and maturing. I think you're reading much too much into the show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think our writers pretty much were uh, doing a good job. Um, we just said the lines, you know. Also, is, is, does Data qualify as a man? <laughs> I, I mean, do I identify as a man? Uh, he is fully he functional. He is fully functional. I know. <laughs> we did a whole episode about that. That was they uh, gave, uh, It was the measure of a man. The measure of a man, which is a surprise. A surprisingly good episode, and I say surprisingly. Why because, surprisingly? Because the guy who played the "I want to take data apart" guy was so Maddox. weird. He was so weird that I didn't know if it was going to work when it was all cut together, but it did. Let me tell you who wrote that. Who wrote that? Melinda Snodgrass. Melinda Snodgrass. A delightful writer. Great writer. Yep. Yes. Great yeah. writer. writer. Yeah. A woman. <laughs> <laughs> My point exactly, Yes. <laughs> all right, over here, please. All right, my question is for Will. Um, Will, if there was one game you could play on tabletop but haven't gotten to yet, what would it be? Root. Uh, it's a new asymmetrical warfare game that was designed by an Afghanistan war veteran and he wanted to build a game that was about what it's like to be in a country where you are an occupying army and some of the people like you and some of the people don't like you and there are religious fanatics and there are people who are just trying to be alive and no publisher would publish it because they were like, this game is too real. So he rethemed the game and made it about adorable furry woodland creatures trying to exist <laughs> in a forest and it is so much fun and it is a beautiful little game with these little animal meeples that's great great fun I love it what it's a it? little too complicated for tabletop um, but but uh, if I could make it work I would wasn't LeVar in that root <laughs> you're thinking of roots oh oh right thank you thanks Hold on. can I can I just say something all levity aside okay which is unlike me yeah. these panels are so heightened when you are a part of them. I agree. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean that from the bottom of my that, heart. That is really how thanks, we Johnny. feel, that's yeah. true. I yeah. don't feel like that because I don't get to talk enough. Because <laughs> everyone's asking you questions. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> Hi, over here. Hello, everyone. This is for everyone. Um, I'm, I've loved you all since the first episode, and I must say, seeing you now, you've all seasoned strikingly well, I must say. And my question is, we have evolved. I mean, essentially, Star Trek has become what can be identified as contemporary mythology. I mean, it's ingrained not only in American culture, but in world culture. And when you started out, perhaps on shaky legs, who knows, and to where you are now, how do you feel about being a part of contemporary mythology? Your figures, your characters, how do you feel about that? Marina? 
<laughs> you're a pantheon, you're gods now. I'm just gonna give you an analogy, all right? So my husband's a musician, and um, I don't think we actually really deep down inside accept, realize that what you said. I mean, I know we know it intellectually, but it's kind of hard to feel that way when you're just a regular person. Um, but my husband said, being on Star Trek is like a musician being asked to join the Rolling Stones, right? Mm. It's like so, you'd like, it's the pinnacle of, you know, that genre. And uh, personally, I don't think about the stuff that you said because it kind of freaks me out a little bit. It really does. Um, but I accept that it's true because, hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so I accept that it's true, but it's really hard to, pu to put yourself in that. You know, when, once I've popped my clogs and I'm looking down or up wherever I am, um, <laughs> I'll realize it more. You know, I think um, for, certainly the way I look at it is I don't actually feel it's, it's, it's me. I think it's all of the whole team, the, the writers and everything, and I know that it's not me. I actually have learned how powerful the show is because I've come to conventions and I've met fans, I've met you guys, because I didn't really understand what role models the characters were on Star Trek until I have met biologists, engineers, surgeons, all the empaths, all, the, all these kinds of... <laughs> You know, and, and then you understand what it means and you see that um, it's your experience and what you were going through in your life when you were watching the show and, and the whole thing of possibilities and it's not just dystopian and, and we actually, you know, enjoy each other and we work together and we solve things even if we disagree. And that to me is really amazing and I get how much we are a part of something that we all share. It's like it is just as much my mythology as your mythology and so it's not about me or my character. It might be about his character or whatever, but I get that it's, it's what we represent. I'm having a mother in space who has to deal with him. I mean, uh, you know, that, that it, parenting can be really hard and they're geniuses, you know, but anyway. So that's, it's an honor actually. Thank you all very much for being such a significant part of my life. Thank you. Hi, over here. Hello, this is for uh, Mr. Franks. Uh, I found out the other day that you directed one of my favorite episodes, uh, The Offspring, where Data creates a child and then loses her at the very end, which is a very emotionally heavy episode. And I was wondering, uh, were you nervous to take on such a, a big, heartfelt episode? And uh, for everybody else, when uh, Mr. Franks was directing, were you excited or was it like, oh, here we go again? <laughs> Well, no, it wasn't Here We Go Again, because it was, that was the first, first episode that I ever got to direct. We're all excited. Yeah. And I had been uh, shadowing and attending Paramount University for two and a half years. And it was the trifecta of good luck. It was a Data episode, and you know how I feel about I played Data. That's Data. <laughs> it was um, Rene Echevarria's spec script, which means it was a, a script that he had submitted as a uh, possibility of joining a writing staff it was the first script he'd written. It was spectacular. He was going on to great things, as you probably know. And the story has resonated. It's a classic sort of sci-fi story. So the combination of all those things, and I was so over-prepared and so excited, and so, and as Gates said earlier, it really was about the, the family was be behind the camera and in front of the camera, and it was uh, lightning in a bottle, as LaVar says. So it was a, a great experience that I look back on quite fondly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, over here. Hi, um, I have a quick question about a particular 90s cartoon. <laughs> After the Star Trek phenomenon, you, some of you had left and went in the direction of an animated series. How did that impact you as opposed to being in front of a screen and working uh, with direction in different ways? Well, you still have a director. You do still have a director when you're doing voiceovers. Johnny, Johnny. Love you. Um, I just want to clear something up with you before you wander off. Um, 
Are they talking about gargoyles? They're talking they must about gargoyles. Yes. Um, Johnny, uh, I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong. Please. That, I'd be um, looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> that um, when the show, you know, when you talk about gargoyles, um, you say that Demona was your the Xanatos sidekick. I don't know who Demona was. Oh. <laughs> I honest, I, was that who you played? Uh, that is who I played. Zona, Xanatos didn't have a sidekick. Exactly. And Were you the a show, good guy or a bad guy? I was a gargoyle. Yeah. And the show was called Gargoyle. Yeah, I was... <laughs> I was the bad guy. You were the bad guy. Yeah. I've never said you were my sidekick. Okay, good, because this is, you see, fans, you lie. Uh, I've yeah. heard you say I that. He I heard uh. that. In real life, she's my sidekick. Oh, in real life, okay, Mark. in real life, okay. No, it was, you know what, I, ha I have to be honest, uh, and, and I have a different experience to voice work than Will Wheaton does because he's really good at it. Um, it's, n it's my least favorite form of acting. Because I, when we were doing Gargoyles, it was great because we did it like a radio play. So we were all sitting in the room at the same time and you could look at the person that you were talking to and react. I really don't get a lot of satisfaction sitting in a sound booth with headphones on, um, acting in a vacuum. Uh, I find it quite hard. And so, yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do, but. I'm amazed. I mean, gargoyles has also become a phenomenon, and it's, it's amazing. And I have heard a rumor that Jordan Peele is a Gargoyles fan. And he might be thinking about doing Gargoyles. I don't know if it would be live action or anything. That's a great rumor. Isn't that a great rumor? Yes. Let's um, spread that. Uh, it is okay. it's, yeah, but Johnny, it's plausible, Johnny, Johnny. yet difficult to verify. It is the <laughs> best kind of rumor. And it's the Johnny? best person to have a rumor about if you want to have a show made this year. To the internet! Yes! Jordan Peele! <laughs> Johnny, if it's live action, we won't be playing the parts. To the internet! <laughs> <laughs> Hey, has anybody here heard uh, the rumor that Jordan Peele might be redoing uh, Gargoyles? <laughs> is it live action? Or I don't remember an where I animated heard that. that. I just I, saw I, it online. Yeah. I don't remember where. Yeah. Is it going to be a movie? Or a, it's either li it might be live action or it could be animated. There's, there's still there. They're deciding Keith now. Keith David be involved? Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, over here. Hi. Hello. Um, I was curious. I have a question for about Riker and Troy. Uh, they have a very non-traditional relationship, and I was, <laughs> I mean, they're not exclusive. I mean, we they're... bang other people. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious to hear your take on their relationship, and is there like an enterprise version of Tinder, online dating, like, I don't know. <laughs> tell them what we did. What? In the beginning oh. of the show, you want to tell the story? Yeah, you tell the story. The beginning of the show, in the pilot, it was quite clear that Riker and Troy had had a relationship prior to, the, to what we all experienced on the counter at Farpoint. At some point during the first season, perhaps, the writers managed to f forget that or th brush it under the carpet. Or like, like her accent. <laughs> <laughs> like, my, like my accent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Marina and I made a choice to hold on to the relationship, and it affected, I believe, how we reacted to each other, reacted to what was going on around us. And I think it gave us an additional element or dynamic in our characters and in our relationship. Fast forward seven seasons and three and a half, three movies, they thought it'd be a great idea if Riker and Troy got married. <laughs> and that, I selfishly believe, is because we kept the relationship alive for 182 episodes and three other movies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, Mina? True? Right, yeah. <laughs> Over here. Hi. Hey. If each of you was beamed down to a separate planet and only had one musical album that you could uh, listen to... Dark Side of the Moon. Did you say Dark Side of the Moon? Did he say... Dark, dark Side of the Moon. Each H help. <laughs> No, not help. Rubber soul. Rubber soul. Okay. Rubber soul. Okay. 
Ella in Paris. What? Who? Ella in oh, Paris. Oh, Ella in Paris, yeah. That's a nice one. Um, <laughs> I, 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 maybe, can I take the whole uh, Sinatra, the Capitol years? Yeah. That's yeah, like a five. Uh, no, yeah, I, I want to take all the Beatles albums. I was going to. I was trying to pick which Beatle album, but you want to have the whole. All he said you could only have one. Okay. The, what if you took a box set? Which one? Which one has the most? Okay, the White album. Yeah, the White double cheat album. So and it's got bad. Songs on it. Right? You're cheating. You're Nobody. changing the rules. I'm the only. I would like the record to reflect. I am the only one who followed the rules in this particular question. Yes, you did, Will. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. If I give mine up, can she have two? <laughs> All right. What if she's on a planet close to where he is, and they. <laughs> what if they have record stores on that planet? No, they don't. Yeah. I think I would take it. Would it would be a Nirvana album? I think. Oh, okay. Nirvana. All right. I think. Now well, that surprises me. That's a great answer. You can only you can you have to pick one. Do you take Unplugged, In Utero, Bleach, or Nevermind? It worries me that I know none of those albums. <laughs> I, I mean, but, but it's, it depends on your mood. They, I, I don't know. I would, I would decide at the last minute and I would grab it. It would be fine. Okay? I, I, love, I, I love Unplugged right now, but before I like, yeah. Thanks. Hi, Thanks. over here. Hi, this is a question for the whole panel. If you read science fiction as children, as a child, what book stuck with you? Well, I, I didn't read science fiction, but I definitely was into, I love science fiction movies. In particular, uh, Forbidden Planet. Uh, I loved Forbidden Planet, which of course is The Tempest. Uh, but I, 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 I really related to Robbie the Robot. <laughs> and look what happened. <laughs> yeah. so, I remember Fahrenheit 451 I liked. Okay, that was a good one. Animal Farm. 1984. Yeah, nine. You were a child? Oh, that, yeah. That's not sci-fi. Like when he was three. Oh, when he was three, he was reading that. That's really no, no, no. Impressive. I wasn't reading that at really three. Impressive. To, uh, That's when I read Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> I was in third grade when I went to this library that I had mentioned earlier, and the uh, mm -hmm. the book that I wanted wasn't available, and I was really bummed out. And the librarian said, "Well, what do you like to watch on TV?" She said, I like to watch Star Trek and Buck Rogers and Battlestar Galactica. And she said, you like science fiction. And I said, I don't know what that is, but okay, is that like Star Wars? And she was like, yeah. She said, here's a science fiction book that I think you will like. And she handed me a book by Robert C. O'Brien called Z for Zachariah, uh, which was relatively new then. This would have been in about 1980, maybe 1981. And I read it and I fell in love with it. And from that day forward, I never left the library without a science fiction book. And that was the one that actually started it for me. And it was that librarian that started it for me. And there's a straight line between that librarian taking the time to talk to that little eight or nine year old kid and me becoming uh, an, an actor who was capable of portraying a kid of the future on Star Trek. Great. Right. Now uh, I have the worst part of my job that I hate to do. You've got our last question. Oh. So no pressure. I didn't get to answer. <laughs> Hi, my name is By Lila. the way, we're supposed to say that we're signing autographs afterwards, and there is a The Crushers photo op afterwards. I'm sorry, I was told to say that. Awesome. Um, why was Patrick Stewart's character allowed to have an English accent when he's French? Excuse me. Troy exactly. wasn't allowed to have exactly. an English accent. Exactly. Excuse me. Yes, why? He was supposed to be French. Yes. Please answer this question. Yeah, but I figured it out. I figured it out, my darling. Because if you notice, when he actually does did scenes when he was in France, did you notice how all the French had British accents? <laughs> so I was always, because you know we hate the French in England. Yeah. So it's, no, listen, it's mutual. They hate us too. And so I always thought, you know, I, like, I think the Channel Tunnel is a good idea as for traveling, but really, do we really want to be joined up to France? And now I've figured it out, because according to Star Trek, there are no more French-speaking people left in France <laughs> in the 24th century. Oh, that's how. Plus, have you ever heard Patrick do a French accent? That's the real reason. He sounds like, he sounds like Peter Sellers that's doing the it real to reason. Clouseau. Yeah, yeah. 
You would Thank not so have much. respected that captain very no, much. No, not one bit. Not one bit. <laughs> well, can I, I can I just say something as a science fiction fan and as a Star Trek fan? There was a question earlier about Star Trek being the modern mythology, and mythology helps us understand why things are the way they are. And Star Trek inspires us to by showing us how things can potentially be. And I think that one of the messages that we get subtly from a British actor playing a French captain is that there comes a point in our future where our national boundaries don't matter, where we're just human beings, where we're just citizens of planet Earth. And I, what I mean? really, really like that. Yeah. Except, I really like that a lot. Doesn't it also signal, it also signals that Patrick had a really good agent too. Yeah. I mean, it's all of the above. Before oh. we go, I always forget to do this, and I'm, because I'm an idiot, uh, and pro postmenopausal. Um, I have a free app. There is a Marina app. You can download it wherever you get your apps, and it's free. So if you want to come onto my app, hello. hello. <laughs> you have to pay a shitload. No, you don't. Mine. It's no. absolutely <laughs> free. It's absolutely free. Well, absolutely. look, I think I speak for everyone here to tell all of you thank you so much, and what a thrill and what a joy it has been to see you all. Thank and you. Thank you for the Thanks, work. everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming out and spending some time with, with us, everybody. You. This has been an awesome con. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. You can subscribe here to so subscribe to the channel. There's more videos off to the left. Mr. J says, don't forget to ring that bell button for more notifications.